of the leading organizers of the extermination of Jews. He was the head of a related department and the security service. He visited himself Palestine and Egypt in 1937, looking for allies and partners and establishing networks. In Cairo, Eichmann meets a journalist, a member of the Grand Mufti's inner circle. One day the world will know Eichmann as a mass murderer. But now, in November 1937, he is sounding out anti-British Arabs. The Mufti is in hiding, but on his behalf the journalists ask Eichmann for German money and arms with which to fight the British. He also makes it clear that Amin wants the Germans to stop Jewish immigration from Germany into Palestine. Four years earlier, the Grand Mufti had contacted the Germans, offering his help in supporting the Nazi cause in exchange for help against the British and the Jews. That time, he got a cool reception. Now, with World War II on the horizon, he hopes it will be different. But as his envoy reports back on his meeting with Eichmann, it is clear that although the Nazis support the Palestinian Arab cause, they are cautious. They have no intention of giving aid on the massive scale the Mufti wants. In the summer of 1938, the Arab insurrection in Palestine against the British and Jews reaches a bloody climax. 10,000 Arab fighters battle across the country. British authorities introduce draconian measures, imprisonment without trial, and demolishing the houses of suspected rebels. As for the leaders of the rebellion, the British arrest five members of the Mufti's Arab Committee and ship them to a remote island in the Indian Ocean. However, the Grand Mufti, Amin al-Husseini, is not among them. As the battle in Palestine rages, the most important rebel of them all escapes to Lebanon. That revolt uh, pinned the British down in the period 1936 to 38 in quite a severe way in the sense that uh, the uh, British found themselves faced by an insurrection across different parts of Palestine, had to use increasing military force to uh, stamp it out. They did eventually defeat it militarily and of course they uh, dismissed the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin Hosseini, from his post and he fled into exile. For more than two years in 1939, the British succeed in putting down the rebellion. However, as a concession to the Arabs, they agree to one of the Grand Mufti's demands. For the time being, they will shelve the idea of a Jewish state. While the Palestinian uprising is coming to an end, events in Europe take a dramatic turn. In September 1939, German armies smash their way into Poland. As the cataclysm of World War II engulfs the great European powers, the waves will sweep through the Middle East. There, they will spark an extraordinary chain of events that leads directly to the rise of Saddam Hussein. sweep into France. France, a great European power with the largest military machine in Europe, is laid low in weeks. With the defeat of France, French colonies around the world, in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, are left in political limbo. What will happen now? Will France keep its colonies, or will Germany take over? France uh, 
uh, of course, has surrendered to Germany. It set up Vichy France, which is effectively a collaborationist regime with Nazi Germany. And the colonies of much of the French Empire, including the mandated territories of Syria and Lebanon, fall under Vichy France. So they become effectively part of the Axis orbit. In the French territory of Syria, Michel Aflouk, a former teacher and now leader of the Ba'ath movement, senses a historic opportunity. With the French weakened, dreams of an independent Arab Syria may soon be a reality. The fascist Ba'ath movement, up to now forced by the French authorities to operate underground, comes out into the open and begins recruiting young men who share its vision. It is the beginning of a whole new phase in Afluk's campaign to unite the Arab world. While Afluk plans revolution in Syria, his contemporary, the Grand Mufti, Amin al-Husseini, arrives in Iraq. Here he will open the next front in his fight against the British. Iraq was created by the British after World War I, out of three separate and warring provinces of the old Turkish Empire, Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra. Iraq's borders were drawn by the British civil servant, archaeologist, and Arabic scholar, Gertrude Bell, working closely with Lawrence of Arabia. In 1921, at a conference in Cairo attended by Winston Churchill, Iraq was given limited independence. To mark the occasion, Lawrence, Gertrude Bell, and Winston Churchill posed for a photograph mounted on camels. A treaty was entered into with the new government of Iraq to ensure that major air bases were retained in the country, together with the right to move troops through should the need occur to uh, reinforce effectively other parts of the British Empire at that time. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the British military protected Iraq's oil, which was exploited by a British oil company. As for the Iraqi royal family, with its boy king, many Iraqis began to see them as puppet rulers created by the British. They feel their country's independence is bogus and bitterly resent the British presence. It is fertile ground for the anti-British agitation of the Grand Mufti. Everyone in Iraq knows of the Grand Mufti's rebellion in Palestine. Now in Baghdad, he is treated like a hero. The Mufti's aim is to take advantage of any and all British weakness, now that they are at war with Germany. His secret plan is to mount a coup that will throw out the Iraqi government and the British military. The Mufti of Jerusalem found a very warm welcome in uh, Iraq. And it's often said that he became part of the backbone of the Iraqi Arab nationalist resistance against the British. Uh, the British felt very uneasy about his presence there, but couldn't do much about it. 